Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, guys, for being here tonight. I'm Laura Kriefman. I'm the CEO here at the Barbican Theatre. This is uh, one of our first sets of our Thursday evening masterclasses. We've had two so far, um, and we're very excited to have Hannah Harris here from Plymouth Culture. Um, the aim of these masterclasses is to uh, provide a free opportunity for people to learn about lots of different things about more on the kind of like the production and industry sides of the creators industries. And so every half term, we're working through a range of different kind of areas from ideas about um, digital theatre, uh, tricks from um, specialists in the industry. So people talking about, you know, who've toured with huge bands all over the world, um, looking at how you manage yourself as a self-employed artist and kind of that kind of role to um, production and stage management techniques. And um, tonight's uh, masterclass feels very timely at the moment, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> which is where's the money? And is uh, working, uh, we're really pleased to have Hannah here to kind of, uh, we set her the great challenge of kind of like demystifying and giving a, uh, uh, a really nice kind of like transparent viewpoint to how you think about either fundraising or uh, writing applications and accessing funding for work. Um, so uh, uh, I'm going to hand over to Hannah. Sure. So I've, I have got a presentation, but I'm really happy to be interrupted with any questions and um, would love this to be as louder. Step into the room. <laughs> I don't do this for a living, as you can see. Um, so yeah, please interrupt me. We can have questions. We can stop at any point. I'd like this to be as useful to you as possible. So if you have personal questions about things that you're working on, I'll do my very best to answer those as well. So that's absolutely fine. So um, as Laura said, um, I work for Plymouth Culture, which is a sector support organisation. Um, and I've prior to that uh, worked in the city for 11 years at Plymouth College of Art where my role was um, business development and I worked on all of our European and international projects including writing funding applications setting up the partnerships and running the projects so um, I have the war wounds of someone who has written multiple applications many of which have been successful many of which were not um, and and also now sitting on the other side in terms of assessing applications as well um, so hopefully I'll give you a little little bit of insight into both of those that will be helpful to you so um, I've got a kind of I guess a series of key points top tips that I think is like the best place to start really so um, for me something you really really need to think about is what the need is I see so many applications that are clearly very passionate and they're clearly really exciting projects but why are they needed is the question you've got to ask yourself and that might be for economic reasons it might be for social reasons it might be for health it might be for specific communities Whatever the reason is, we need to know. <laughs> um, so say it, be really, really clear. And sometimes you'll have data to back that up. And sometimes it will be in your experience and work that you've done up to that point. That really demonstrates that this is not just because you fancy having a go at it. And there is merit in you wanting to do something as artists, but as funders, we, we have to understand why that project is needed above another and what, what is it solving? So you'll, you'll see often that funders are very, very clear on what their objectives are and what their outputs need to be. And that's either because maybe it's a trust and they have overarching objectives or because it's a specific application. So don't ignore that bit. At the end of the day, a funder is often inviting you to respond to their needs and their objectives. So they need to know how what you're doing answers a, a, a problem for them or solves something that they are equally as interested in as, as you are. Secondly, be really clear and focused. I can read pages and pages of an application and still not know what they want to do. <laughs> And it's really annoying <laughs> because you can get the passion and you can get the kind of sense of, of, you know, what someone kind of why they want to do it and what they want to do. But what is it they're doing? There is there is real value in, in upfront saying, you know, we want to deliver 
we want to produce because what happens then is for the person reading it is everything they read after that is framed around that understanding and if you if someone is trying to find the answer whilst they're reading they're basically not listening to what you're writing you're making it really hard for them so there's something about opening um, your application or finding space really really early on to be very clear about what you want to do and, and what the focus of that attention is so that instantly that is something that your reader is not having to figure out for themselves and it's amazing how many people miss it you will have seen a lot oh my God, <laughs> like so they good. miss that you know and you get to the bottom and you think well it sounds great but I actually don't even know what you're doing yeah. so it's just so key to not forget that initial opening line that, that explains it to someone and then there's the other element of once you've been really focused and really clear, you've got to create a story. You've got to hook them in. There's got to be a connection to what they're reading on the page and what they're feeling about this project. So they, they need to be taken on a journey with you. So if you've talked about the need, you've said what you're going to do, then there's that space to really say, you know, where your passion is behind this, why this project will do something that others won't and you have to take them on that journey don't make any assumptions because they they might not know you they might be reading hundreds or thousands of other applications so you've got to ensure that they are with you on this journey and that when they get to the end of the application they feel as strongly about it as you do and so that will be about the language you use and the sense of kind of passion and enthusiasm you can get into the work that you're doing. And of course, some applications might not be written, they might be videos or, or, or submit verbal submissions. So that again, there's an opportunity to get that kind of passion across and that sense of storytelling that comes through it. There has to be a narrative weaved through it so that people get an emotional connection as, as well as a clarity around what you're doing. Laura, do jump in if there's anything you wanna. Yeah, okay. Um, use their language so when you're getting really passionate about everything which is good um it doesn't hurt to play back their language to them so it's the it's the classic scenario of writing a cv you know you you need to tell them what they have asked for and just repeat it back to them so you you need to have a real understanding of the type of language that your funder that you're applying to will be familiar with so not only are you cutting out jargon that maybe you're really used to because it's your specialism or your sector and might not be theirs, but you're also kind of reflecting their language. So if they have a very economic focus to what they're doing, then that might be the terms and the language you use. If it's very community focused, then those are the terms. So it's often you might have a project and if you're applying to multiple funds for, the, for, for a sort of cocktail of funding, you would need to be tweaking the language even if the project is the same for each of those funders and and anyone reading an application can tell straight off if the same project is just being submitted to different funders as we will know whether you've put energy into changing that language and talking to me as that funder or just talking to anyone and you get exactly the same thing when you're applying for a job people will know whether it's a standard letter and a standard cv that you've submitted so just give it time, you know, take the time to understand how those organisations speak, what kind of things they're interested in, so that, that language gets played back. And you can do that in really easy ways as well. You can, you can make it easy for yourself. So if there's specific words in that commissioning call and there's specific things that they're trying to target, write those words into those sentences and make sure you're actually answering them. Write them in bold. Yeah. I've done that quite a lot. This project will do X buzzword by doing this, this, and this, and it will also do this. But right, so it's really clear because often they're having to assess against those things. Um, if there's sub questions, you know, in the in a question section, use those as headings. Mm. Why mm. am I interested in doing this for Plymouth? Okay, that question is about Plymouth. You know or this will do this for Plymouth by doing X, Y, Z. You, um, you're, you're trying to make it easy for somebody else to be able to go, ah, I know how this lands. 
in what I'm being asked to, in the way I'm being asked to read it and assess it, basically. Yeah. Um, and that structure is really key for the yeah. clarity. Like, I think sometimes you fe it feels like you're being a bit patronizing sometimes yeah. when you're putting titles or you're putting yeah. things well. But actually, for, for an assessor, it's so useful. Oh. <laughs> if we've got criteria and we can easily go, OK, yeah, no, they've met that bit. Oh, they've yeah. mentioned that. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. You know, and you're over that first hurdle at least. Yeah. And changing the language doesn't undermine the project. No. Just so you know, changing the language doesn't doesn't um, diminish the artistry or the creativity yeah. or the overarching storytelling. When I go into a room with the construction industry, I will be talking about the increase in their rental value on their land if they do activity um, whilst the site is being built. I will be talking about the publicity for them and the increased footfall and engagement with their marketing campaign. I will be talking about how it fits within their health and safety regulations and how it's not going to disrupt their build schedule. They will have seen the fancy video and the fancy pictures. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in that room in the first place. But what I have to do is present it to them in a language which is easy for them because somebody has to be able to go and advocate for you somewhere else. So you, by using their language, it makes it very easy for them to turn around if they are excited by it mm. and be able to communicate that to another organization that uses that, that coded language. So you're just helping somebody else be able to be your advocate and champion, champion you on, a, on, a, on an assessment panel, on a yeah. board, on a commission, and, that, and that's what often happens so someone who's making an initial assessment then has to take it to a bigger panel or a regional level and advocate for your project yeah. so that you know someone who doesn't know you potentially certainly doesn't know the project has to then explain it on again so if it's in a way that feels comfortable with their their language their organization it's going to be much easier to do that and I think you're right I think often people feel like it's a dumbing down mm -hmm. or it's a kind of it's not true to their artistic integrity. And it's not about that. Fundamentally, we're not asking you to change your project, just asking you to use a pitch that works with particular audiences. Yeah. And, and, and that's still true to your values and exactly what you want about the project, or you wouldn't, you wouldn't be having that conversation in the first place, hopefully. Same way as you explain what you do differently to your gran and the person who works in your corner shop to your core collaborator and uh, your partner in bed. You, you frame things in different ways to different people all the time. You, make, you adapt it, you find simpler, cleaner, yeah. clearer, non-coded language. It's the same principles. Um, and, and actually that's a really good point about using your network to help with that as yeah. well. Like my, my husband doesn't work in the creative industries. He drives petrol tankers for a living. So he's a really good benchmark for me. If I talk to him about something, if he goes, oh, that sounds cool, then I know I've done it. Like, that's, that's okay. <laughs> and if he goes, yeah, whatever, then I think, okay, I need to work a bit harder at this. And so, you know, if you've got a network of friends or family mm -hmm. and they don't understand what you're saying, probably a person reading it doesn't either because there's no guarantees that that person is a specialist in what you're talking about or has the same technical expertise. You don't necessarily know what background they've come mm -hmm. from um, in terms of specialism or sector or anything like that. So I think that's always a good benchmark yeah. to, you know. Um, okay, so showing them your track record. And if you haven't got a track record, at least your credentials, because part of this is, and, and it, you know, it's, it's awful, but it is, it's a competitive world out there. So it's not just about, is this the best project? It's about giving them confidence in you as an organization or a person to be able to deliver on that. And that, you know, what, uh, with, with everything else out of the way, as brilliant as a project will be, if there's no confidence that you can deliver, there's that huge stumbling block for someone. So if you've got track record in doing these projects, in managing budgets, in setting up partnerships, then tell people, don't assume again, talk to them about how you did those other things. And something that's always really valuable is kind of how you managed problems and challenges. It's not all rosy. 
And I think that's okay to say, because what they want to see is not just that you've got a track record in delivering, but that you've got a track record in managing a project. And a lot of the time managing is problem solving and realizing it's not gonna quite happen how you wanted it to. So how do you respond to that? So they're gonna wanna see that if they give you this money and something starts going awry, you can problem solve for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so if you, you know, you can talk about your credentials, your track record, evidence, if you've got previous reports of projects or outcomes. And again, sometimes that's videos or sometimes that's testimonials from participants or other people. Again, it, it, it's just about giving that funder confidence in you as an organisation as well. Again, they might not know you, so they need some kind of reference point to make sure that they, they can hand over that. That yeah. money and know that you're going to do what you say you're going to do and that might be really what might feel for you really small you know if you've been working a group with 10 people in that specific community for 10 years on a voluntary basis yeah. because there was a need and you've identified that need holy moses that is track record and credentials so some of the things are not necessarily be about them having been in a in a formal codified, yeah. I have a business management degree. It can be in those levels. And sometimes it's not just about you on your own. It's who you're bringing to the table with you, who your collaborators are. You know, I would often, when I started out, you talk about people who are my advisors. So I would have a, a group of people who I knew yeah. were my regular sounding boards. And so I'd write them in as being, they are part of my advisory group advisory group these people who advise us and will be helping me make sure that we are doing due diligence on our accounting you know whatever yeah. it needed to be to help that feel like we're approaching it because we don't have a right to this money this is the really really interesting thing is that when we're applying for stuff they are this is often money from charities yeah. or from corporates and they have they have a tr they have they are accountable to somebody else so again, you're making it easy for them, for you to be accountable to them. And so it's fine for you not to have skills in an area, yep. but then to just go, but what I've done is in the budget, I've made sure I've got somebody who's going to work with me and I'm paying for QuickBooks, which I use or, you know, Absolutely. and everything's going through this accountancy software and that's in the budget. So, you know, even if it's identifying those things, it's, it's looking at how you solve, solve them is the wrong word, but... Um, it's that confidence, it's yeah. that giving them that confidence that you've, you've thought about and understood how that project might go, where the complications might be, and that you can, you can demonstrate that you've got a robust group of people yeah. around you at the start to do that. So it's, you, you mentioned different partners, but name dropping partners, because that means, oh, okay, if they're on board, yeah. then obviously they've got some assurances that you know what you're doing and you've yeah. had a good conversation. And I, and I think you're absolutely right about that. So when, when I used to work on the European projects, which are the single most complicated mm -hmm. thing I've ever had to do, um, at, you know, lots of different cultures, lots of different languages, um, and just being really clear about what you bring to the table mm -hmm. was, was ultimately the best thing. Yep. So we would go in as Plymouth College of Art and say, this is who we are. This is what we do. We do it really well and we, we, we will not let you down. Yep. But we don't do any of this. And that's why we're in a partnership. And that, that clarity is fine. Like you don't have to be all things to all people, but you have to give confidence that you've got the other elements around you or access to it. And that's when you get your credentials kind of built into, into their kind of mindset. Yeah. Really. And that's where it's really great to have that as a set, like to really figure out what your selling points are you know i have done two what solo do exhibitions to the table? Yep. and or i have delivered uh, 15 community orientated projects or i have choreographed five shows on national tour or i have um uh, produced six live music events in varying sizes from 30 to 1500 yeah you know it's like oh okay oh cool yeah right Okay. Because behind all of that is a skill set that people will recognise, they'll connect to, it gives them that confidence yeah. level again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, build a sense of urgency. So I think one of, the, one of the things I've always found that's really interesting is when you read a project and you think it's really nice, but it can probably wait. 
And so there needs to be this kind of, and it's quite a fine line to tread, mm -hmm. actually, um, to not veer into the, you have to give me the money and I'm demanding it, <laughs> and, and stay on the side of, actually, if we don't get this money in this round, this won't happen. And I think it's explaining it in that way, that this, this money, this fund, this activity that you're going to do with it, has consequences if it doesn't happen and then it, it means that for the funder they have to make a decision and they have to actively turn it down rather than think i can just forget about it and move mm -hmm. on and and that that finding the wording and and the way in which you can present a sense of urgency for the funder is really key because again it's part of that journey they're like oh okay i i get it you know you've told me the need there's all of this activity that's happened previously. And actually, if you don't do this, you know, this, this is the missing piece and I can solve that for you. Yeah. And you will always, you will never be the only person in that funding pot. Yeah. Fund, just so you know, um, there was a, a, an opportunity for an artist in residence with the London Philharmonia. And they had 370 applications for that all of which were assessed independently by, I think, two people across mm. their wider assessment panel across the UK, which then came down to the final 40 who were, you know, debated in the room. It's that level, um, which sounds demoralizing, but it's in the sense of going, if there's one or the other, and one has a real kind of real sense of, ah, and one would say, hey. Yeah. And one where lots of different people who come from very different backgrounds can read it and go, I get it. Whilst the one where you go, that's so oblique, I don't know what's going yeah. on. You know, that's shifting that, the, the shifting of the pile that will help. It can only help. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Let them know what they're buying for their money. At the end of the day, they are giving you money. And so you have to tell them what they're going to get. And it's very tempting to be willy. And, and, and sometimes you don't have to be explicit in what you're going to deliver, but they still need to know what they're buying. So even if you're not listing outputs, although many of them will ask for that, they want to know what the change is going to be. Yeah. At the end of the day, funders are still humans and it will be an individual that, well, at the moment, until we go completely robotic, but at the moment, it is an individual and a human that is reading that application. So they are going to want to know personally that they're making a difference. And so if you can describe to them, even not in numbers, but in the impact and the change that it will have on, on people or places, communities, organisations, Again, you're, you're telling that story and you're inviting them to be part of the solution. And at the end of the day, what you've got then is someone who's almost an extension of your team, who totally advocates for you, knows exactly what they're getting, knows if they don't give them money, it will be catastrophic because this just won't happen. And they will really understand how they have personally had an impact on those people's lives. And they will like that. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, people want to do good things. And people generally don't work in funding unless it's about passing on some of, some of that benefit and, and, and being part of that. So once you've got that sense of urgency, they're going to want to know, OK, fantastic. And, and what, what's the change and transformation that we can have? So sometimes it's good to talk in numbers and actuals. And sometimes it's good to talk in terms of impact and what people will feel and how it will make them be able to change their life or move on and do other things. So think about balancing that kind of really metric level information and that much more emotional human connection that ultimately the reader is, is able and capable of developing mm. as part of your narrative. <laughs> Get to know your funder. So I said to Laura at the start, there are so many funders out there and whether you're dealing with trusts and foundations or philanthropic giving, lottery, whether it's innovation funds, European or otherwise, every funder is different. 
some of them like to build a relationship with people before you apply. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you haven't done that, then you're, you, you know, they just won't even consider you. So some of them would expect you to have a conversation, would expect you to do a sort of expression of interest, have that kind of relationship and almost help shape the project with you so that when you submit it, that they're, they're already in that headspace. Others don't, you know, do not want any contact, some trust, they want, want anything. Um, it's very um, objective in that, in that way. Um, but they're all different and it is about respecting that process mm. and where it's available to you, if there is a contact, making the most of it. So if they put an email address or a phone number or they list their trustees so you can get in touch with them and kind of advocate, do so. And also um, read their information. Uh, like th th these days, most funders or commissioners will put a huge amount of resources mm. online. You know, how much the money is, what the, par the, the parameters are for how much you can apply for what the criteria is going to be assessed against, what the questions are, what their stakeholders want, what their turnaround timeline is, mm. what's their, um, uh, what are the sub bits of their question, what are the things you'd need to, like, if you get it, bear in mind, like, so that you don't, like, genuinely, if you've got a fund that's going to take 18 months, uh, six months to turn around, don't apply for a project where the start date is four months time because they just get grumpy and sad the other end because it yeah. means you haven't read their things and you haven't given them due courtesy same as if it needs to have a certain type of bank account then hold off until you're in that place or partner with somebody who is ready in that place to have that certain type of bank account and it feels hard sometimes reading that stuff but increasingly funders are much have also learned their lessons that they yeah. must create easy read versions or accessible versions, or you can pick up the phone. I certainly have for funders where we've been approaching stuff for here and it's been a new funding organization that I don't have a relationship with. And I'll pick up the phone and go, can I ask you some stupid questions? It's the first time we've applied to your fund. Yeah. And I think what we're, we want to apply with is in line with your current objectives. But can I just talk that through with you briefly and just, just make sure, cause I don't want to waste your time. Yeah. That's really honouring them the other side. Um, but it also means you've sounded things out and you can listen in between the lines to what's being said and go, oh, oh, that bit. Oh, okay. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But that bit comes in, you know. Um, and you will hear their language. So the things that might feel hard to read on paper, they will say out loud. And then you, and you can hear their resonance of what they're kind of interested in. Mm -hmm. And it's graphed, but... But I mean, also, I think what's what I always found really useful in that is it helps you to rule out funders yeah. as well, because, yeah. you know, there is, there is sometimes where you'll have a conversation and you come off a bit perhaps disheartened because it's clearly not for you, but actually you're just not wasting your time then mm -hmm. or their time. And there's a lot to be said in valuing a process that just rules things out as well. Mm -hmm. So that when, when you then are putting your core energy into something and these things do take a lot of time and energy, you, you you're kind of at, le at least you know that you're talking to someone who shares your values or has funded similar things before and, and I think that's the other thing to mention with increasing transparency most funders are putting information up about um, projects and organizations they've funded previously use that information like trawl their websites then go to those other partner project websites have a look at what they delivered how they did delivered it how what sort of budget ranges they were pitching and pick up the phone to them as well there's there are so many people out there who have had funding who would be happy to share their experience with you and sometimes that is purely around the application but sometimes if they are, have been funded they've gone a step further and have a slightly different relationship with the funder mm -hmm. that you wouldn't get from just an application process or a phone call. And lots of those people are really happy to have a conversation yeah. to share draft examples that they've worked on, project outputs or reports. Um, and again, it is a bit of legwork because you may be following a trail through websites, but it's really, really worth it for getting that inside knowledge of, of how other people have been successful yeah. as well. I've just had uh, two calls in the last fortnight um, about a fellowship I did a couple of years ago, which was a funded fellowship. 
So in my head, it counts very similar to this, the way you have to approach how you write the application. And I have talked, and they've asked what were your experiences of doing it and mm. how did you find the process? And I've talked through them both very clearly. The three pieces of advice I was given from somebody else before I applied, which I think were vital to understanding what that fellowship was about. Mm. So I have shared the same things, which I think made such a difference to what I wrote and how I applied the first time around. I've shared key findings of just statements about going, actually, they want to know you warts and all, and it's a really tough year and you're going to be in an argument with yourself for the entire year. So you have to be prepared to be going through quite a robust process. Because mm. that will also mean some people go, actually, no, this year, that's too much. Yeah. And but so that again, will value in ruling yourself or, out. or the, the fund yeah. out at that stage. Yeah. yeah. And I will always do that because that was a gift that was given to me and, then I'll, and therefore I gift that on. And, and, you know, and so it, we're talking about funders, but it's also, it's, this, it's a very similar approach with commissions and with residencies, because yeah. those are funded. They are still funding coming from a certain body that has enabled that thing to happen. And therefore they're still having to jump through very similar hoops as the funders themselves do if it's a trust or foundation yeah so it's still an application yeah. process they're still pitching people against each other yeah. you know it's still got all of those elements to yeah. it so um yeah I, I think that's really key and people are very generous in my experience mm. and there's also I think people quite like to be asked for advice and mm. guidance and you know that if they can pass that on then often often they will um okay so I know I'm talking about funding but I spent um, lots of years as a business advisor to small businesses in Cornwall. And there were so many occasions when I had to sort of stop mid conversation and go, so, so why do you need the funding? <laughs> because people sometimes get so hang up on not being able to even take that first step until they get funding that they never take that first step. Mm. And it's so debilitating to think that nothing can happen unless I'm funded. And actually there's evidence that when you have, so some, some counties get, um, well used to, it'll, it'll all change, but more European funding than others based on their deprivation. And it is proven that there is better success rate in business and business startup in the non-funded mm -hmm. regions because they just get on and do it. They don't feel entitled they don't feel that they have to wait and they don't feel that unless I get this, there's no point trying because, of course, I can't do anything about funding. So for me, for, you know, we have funding and we work in funding, but there do stop and think, what do you actually need this money for? And are there other routes? Are there sponsors that you can work with? Are there partners mm -hmm. that you can negotiate with and barter with? You will always have something to trade and there's lots to be said for a trading society yeah. <laughs> especially now where cash is not king so you know what what can you offer that gets you something that allows you to move your project on are there fundraising things that you can do or crowd funders that, that you could be part of and so i just my personal experience and it was really sad to see people like feeling like they couldn't they couldn't go anywhere and, you know, I just had one one example and he, he just was he was fantastic and he just had a great idea. And I was just like, but I think it's going to make lots of money. He's like, yeah, totally. I was like, OK. And I, I really think, you, you know, your market. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've done all my research and everything. And I was like, so why don't you just launch it as a product, especially if it has a commercial value? And, you know, and he, he'd just done so much and he didn't even realize how close he was to just actually running a business. And it was really, it was kind of really sad to see and it was really good that he did do it in the end. But I just think there's a lot to be said about taking a step back and not going down that funding rabbit hole unless you're really, really sure about it, because it will absorb time and energy that sometimes could be better spent somewhere else. Maybe, maybe it's better spending your time negotiating with a, a sponsor yeah. or a business partner or yeah. you know an investor do you actually want a grant or do you want are you prepared to give equity away yeah. you know there are lots of different business models that mean this isn't your only route so you know you're here because probably you've got ideas you've got passion you're already doing things so maybe you can just make it happen and really really it is the flip side it 
um, when I started my dance company way back when I was working, I was running a theatre in London. I was working too many hours, always too many hours at the theatre. So I started scheduling and stealing back my Friday afternoons because I realised they were the most defunct time to be trying to be available for other people. And so I, my dance company would rehearse every Friday afternoons in my theatre around whatever set was there. because I was owed so much time for the, money, the work I was already putting in and there wasn't ever any other needs and we were always out and the space was left exactly as it needed to be. Yeah. And so we just started. And that's about resource, not money necessarily. Yeah. You know, so yes, you needed a space and you needed some time, but how yeah. do you carve out those things? Absolutely. And, and what I also used to do quite a lot of once we got more established as a company, especially when we were Helly and Trace and we were working with movement and technology and doing stuff which was really at the front edge of stuff that was really hard for people to under, most people to understand. I knew it was my responsibility for us to make the first version of it before we went to the commissioners. Because we had to make it tangible and real and understandable for others. So that all that stuff earlier about the language and how you tell the story and how you make it easy for people to figure it out and what it does on the tin, you know, does what it says on the tin. I knew that was my responsibility because what we were doing was so unusual. So we would do uh, a commercial show or some commercial workshops and we'd save all that money and squirrel it away so that we could work as a company on the thing that we were really excited about or that felt really important to us or that satisfied us in a different way. And we would slowly but surely work on that. And we maybe only had about £4,000 a year in total in that pot yeah. every year. Um, and usually that was money I wasn't paying myself out of, you know, that should have in theory come back to me as the director of the company. But it meant that we were making stuff that we really liked as collaborators and I yeah. could bring people together. And that made a huge difference to the type of work we were making and the quality of it. And then how easy it was for somebody to figure it out and get it. It's that sort of proof of concept bit, isn't yeah. it? So you've, you've, you've put money into development. Yeah. And you see that a lot, actually, a lot of conversations I had with sort of um, gaming studios yeah. and game developers that, you know, commercially certain things will be bought and that's okay. Yeah. But the things they're really interested in doing in, no one's going to sponsor right now or pay for. Yeah. So they have to do that in their own time, yeah. proof of concept, and then all of a sudden, you know, the right time comes for them to launch that and there's an opportunity. Yeah. And that might be a Patreon and that might be yeah. um, selling some of the music on Bandcamp and that might be doing coffee and cake mornings with really good storytelling or that might be um, uh, releasing your own books on Unbound and getting people to sponsor the first print run of that. Yeah. Or it might just be that your what you want to do doesn't have to be your business focus which is a whole nother conversation sure yeah. but, um, i don't know how far to go with this but. yeah but, but like sometimes actually um our passion where our passions live and what's the difference i could easily and have easily in previous years spent up to six months of the year trying to secure our contracts and yeah. our commissions and our work i i would be lucky if i had six fun months now, I actually like how you the, the challenge of figuring out how to tell the talk, tell, mm -hmm, not according to that, of having to figure out how to tell that story and bring those stakeholders in. That to me is a really fascinating and a brilliant bit mm. of the challenge of understanding a project and getting the language right and finding its audience and interrogating it. And I like that. That's really juicy to me. But that six months of loveless graft and then you get to do a whiz bang and that's that's quite a lot and that needs to be considered that yeah. you know and because i think there's that element of rejection to consider as Ooh, well as, yes. part of, as part of it which is like really personal because you yeah. know you you know whatever you go into whatever project you set up or business or initiative like is your world and you really believe in it and you believe in the needs so every time you get rejected it is really hard yeah. <laughs> and it never and it actually never gets any easier no, no matter how many you do of this and and the thing with funding is it is very much a numbers game so you <laughs> you have to um, as much as we're talking about top tips there really is no no kind of easy route to it it is a numbers game a lot of the time and that's why organizations employ full-time funders so they're just churning out a a, a number of applications yeah. And then you know you'll get a percentage of them that land and are successful. So that is actually a really big 
internal, mental, physical, emotional resource that you yeah. have to know that you can put in. And if every time you get that, you feel like it's a failure or a step back, it, it might actually be creating an artificial barrier for you to actually just go and do something. <laughs> and that's where the knowing your funders comes in as well, because when not to put that effort in. Yeah. When you go, oh, on the headline, it looks a perfect fit, except for I'm not an organization of 500 people. Cool. Yeah. Don't uh, step away from that. And we used to, I used to work on the, the average of one in 10. Mm. Of every 10 applications we'd put in, we'd get one back that was successful. So then there is also the law of averages of whether or not that was the 70K application <laughs> or the 3K application. Which mm. often take as much work as each uh, other. Yes. That's, that's you very know. much so. Yeah. Um, and actually, I think the ratios are worse at the moment. And I'm just being really honest with that. You know, I think it's nearer one in 15, maybe even one in 20 at the moment. Yeah. And so you, you, but that's not you failing. No. It's the, 370 people going down to a short list of 40 for one opportunity. If you are getting to the shortlisting stage, if you are getting interviewed for things, if, you're, if people are coming back to you for whatever, yeah. you're doing brilliantly. It's just there's often only one fit or two fits or 80K in the entire, in the entire pot and they've got two at 20K and two at 10 and then four at 50. How do you, what's equitable about how you yeah. spread up, share up that money? And especially if rightly so, what a lot of funders have to do is balance that portfolio. Yeah. So they'll be looking at geographical reach, they'll be looking at art form, they'll be looking at diversity and age and gender. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully they should be looking mm -hmm. at all of, all of those things. So sometimes it's not because you have a terrible application. It's just that the time that you've submitted against the other portfolio just doesn't quite fit together. Mm. Um, and so I just, yeah, I just don't want people to feel de dejected and I don't want you to feel like that's the only route to make things happen because it absolutely isn't. And sometimes going down a different route, a quicker route, um, that it doesn't invest all of your time in funding applications might just help you start something and then it's better for applications anyway because mm. you've got your track record and, and, and you've got your credentials and you're, you, you're able to sell it because you've got real life footage and, and photographs and things like that to sell as well. Mm. And that's where I was going to leave it as my top however many tips that was. They were good tips. And I'm really happy to answer any questions, obviously. I've got a question, yes. um, which is about how it works on the other side. So we've, we've both spoken quite a lot about applying, applying. Yeah. Uh, can you talk through um, how the assessing is often approached? I mean, it varies in terms of stages. So mm -hmm. whether there's an um, expression of interest and you get through and then you're invited to, to fully submit. Those are often quite good because you get to test the war and you're not putting all of your, all of your energy in. But definitely, I mean, I can only talk from my perspective mm -hmm. of having been on that side of things. There's definitely an element of just checking eligibility to start with. So, you know, it, nothing annoys me more than realizing someone's not eligible and that why have they applied? Because it's just, it's then taken me time to read that and have to dismiss it. So, you know, don't agitate your assessor straight off. It's just not, it's not a good place to be. So there's definitely a sort of skim read around eligibility and making sure that, that they, you, you fit the basic checklist um, so that then we can rule things out straight off if we need to. Then, then there's an element of really, um, I, I like to, to really just read and understand what each of them is about. And I get a sense then for where, you know, who's given me that story, who's given me the whole journey that I can personally buy into. I then do a sense of check of whether I think it's deliverable and realistic. So coming back to that, do I, yeah, I love the project, but do I think this organization can do it? And I, do I think they're going to make the change? Is it practical and realistic what they've put in? And then there's mostly a scoring matrix. So mm -hmm. once you've got that in your head as an assessor, you'll start to attribute the scores. 
And, and so there's, there is something really powerful about that story sitting alongside that eligibility, because what happens when you've read so many, there will be some that stick in your mind and you inevitably score to that. And you will start to, and I think this is human nature, I don't think this is just me, you, one will become your benchmark. And so if you, if you, you might either really hate one or really like one, but that starts to become your benchmark. So you start to move them either side <laughs> of that benchmark yep. because that's the one you remember for whatever reason, whether it's good or bad. And so it's really interesting how you, you know, whether you as an assessor come back to things and reread them, whether you do it on a first sift and that's that. So there's got to be something memorable in there. That means you become that benchmark. Your application is the one to beat. And that starts to make it possible yeah. for a panel to assess. And then that final kind of, so I'm talking from an experience where you'd often do that individually, and then you'd come together with a group. So there's an, there's an element of individual scoring and reflection and then there's a kind of panel discussion. Um, and that's where that's where a lot of the time the scoring has been done. So it is a discursive mm. process. It is about understanding other people's views and what they saw and what they read in the application and starting to do that portfolio balancing mm -hmm. of, OK, well, they're all theatre companies right now and we don't want that. We want something in this space. So there's definitely an element then of once you've got your, your baseline group of projects that you know are fundable how do, what does the balance look like mm. and that that's where sometimes there are winners and losers in that mix I think mm. does that help as a yeah sort it of does process? and the matrix thing I'm just going to fluff on that is really really important to think about is that as part of the due diligence funders take their responsibilities really seriously it is very they have to justify they often have to get whatever applications they want to fund signed off by the board. They have to be able to prevent, present due diligence about why this is a good use of that funding. Yeah. Um, and uh, they, that, that kind of matrix and the way it's assessed is a part of how they try to create a level playing field. And often they have a wider group of people who they ask as experts or as um, people who understand the fund to feed back in on that. And that can be really interesting because actually the, the, the way you're asked to assess is maybe not the thing that you expect it to be on. It will often be about the, the subheadings on a question, mm. not about the, um, the heart of a project, if that makes sense. Well, and, and often the, amount, the amount of conversations in a panel that say, do I like the project? Yes. Do I think it's right for this fund? No. No. Do I think they've answered the question? No. And that, yeah. that's, that is really hard for a panel yeah. that's doing that assessment because they can see a wonderful, beautiful project. But is it right for that fund? Is there a fit? Is a different question. And that clarity of like, we were talking about how you make it easy for people. There was a, uh, there was a project that I was assessing where I was like, oh, I feel like I'm missing information. I went via the link they sent. It gave me nothing. I went via another link and found out the person's work was awesome and got a really good sense of it. And I was like, ah, oh, oh, I totally get it. This is like the best thing. Nobody else did that legwork. Yeah. That project didn't get shortlisted by anybody else. Or well, I presume nobody else did that legwork because it wasn't what was on that paper. And I had additionally done three or four or five other steps and then gone, oh, right. Um, and the problem is, is that most people won't do that and they're not allowed to. They have to yeah, do it off of what is there yeah, in front of them. There's not often an obligation that someone would put that work in yeah. because the onus is on you to, to give that to that, yeah. that funder or that, that panel. And so there's, yeah, you can't assume that someone's going to look at your website or going to look at that presentation or that extra report that you've sent. Yeah. So if it's crucial, it's got to be part of part of what you're showing to them, part of what yeah. you're put, you know putting in your application. Yeah, it's really. It's a really. Yeah. Um, it's just a different way of thinking. About it. Oh, yes, sorry. Right, yeah, just so on a, on a job, I've got a background in um, kind of the generation construction of this development. So I'd just like to compliment you both, really, just to say. We enjoyed your pitch, and especially the way you kind of summed up the, um, the dilemma between chasing money as a means to an end, and the, the danger yeah. is it becomes an end in itself. 
So there, there was that. So, but my question was, if you had a, um, an artist who wanted, who was experienced but wanted to develop their own products and get them off the ground themselves, but have no credentials, don't got insurance, you know, got some perhaps plays that aren't you know, worked out and stuff, where, where's the step forward for them? Because the, as you said, they've got to run due diligence and have producer yeah. responsibilities. How does that person you know, step forward? I think for me, I think that's who you partner up with mm. and how you create a stepping stone for yourself as the so uh, I'm gonna, so I had I went from uh, running a very mainstream dance company and choreographing theater and musical theater and running a venue in London. and I got very bored and I wasn't answering the questions I was really excited by. And I wanted to start exploring how movement and technology work together. So I had no track record over there. I had a track record in musical theatre choreography and running a venue. And I need and I therefore I needed to find an opportunity to become part of a community where I could learn and where the community had a track record. So knowing that there was something I wanted to interrogate and question. I looked for opportunities where I could be part of something and I ended up doing a, a very small residency. I think it had a thousand pounds attached to it with the Pervasive Media Studio in Bristol. At the Pervasive Media Studio in Bristol and found my home and my community and basically went, cool, <laughs> you're not getting rid of me. She hasn't um, left. <laughs> I haven't left, no, that's still my community. Um, but what was great was the reason, the, the, fund the residency I went for was one of their open access funds which are about you having a question and are about you having permission to come in from a different track record mm. and wanting to change direction and it's not a huge financial commitment but it then meant that I was in a world where I could then grow and change it meant then I could start talking about and embedding the things I was hearing and and then I had their, them to use as a sounding board when I did want to apply further. Yeah. And they became, and you know, so you build relationships that way. So I found coders. So I didn't go, I am now suddenly, I can actually now do coding and everything else, but I didn't have to go and go as a choreographer and an expert coder and a visual artist and a composer. Um, I was able to say, as a choreographer, I'm looking at this and I'm based in this community and I have found this brilliant coder and this brilliant composer, and we're asking this question, and through this community, we found this platform to show it. Do you want to invest in that? And that's the collective track record. That's the and collective, the collective yeah. Credentials. And being really clear on what you bring to the party, you yeah. know, that's, that's absolutely fine, especially as each time you do a project, you might be gaining new skills. So like you said, you, you can now code, but you, did, you couldn't before. So there's a there's a process that you're going on to pick up new skills but in the meantime surround yourself with people who have those skills yeah and then you're you know what you're doing is you're 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 still an artist and you're still doing what you're brilliant at but you know that you're evolving into a new space but with a partnership there are also times where those partners if they're large enough will be your sponsor mm -hmm. and be your re referee or mm -hmm. be you know be your your reference um, and there's a lot to be said about those kind of backing you in that space as well. If that's a, it's the first step. Yeah. Barbican's, Barbican's really good at that. You take on associates and you you um, nurture organisations as they sort of move out, but don't have that whole infrastructure mm. themselves. And that's sometimes where it can, as an individual, feel like there's not a lot of transparency about, well, somebody's got this grant and yet there's only £5,000 for the artist, say. But actually what that grant is allowing the organization to do is then team you up with a producer in-house and tech time and use of the space and access facilities so they are they are putting in another they're putting in a, a package of support which is worth 20 30 000. and so that's why sometimes looking for those artist residencies is a really good way especially if you want to change direction and we always have a right to change direction and ask different questions always um, that that they, that's a really good way of doing it because then you go cool now i have somebody who i can talk to about language for marketing and i have a space where they'll bring in an invited audience in and i can test something differently and there's permissions around yeah. that and they're going to host that and facilitate that so i feel safe and my team feel safe um 
I was just going to ask, because it's harder to get funding if you're under 18, is that, I don't know, I haven't looked into it really, is that really, that, is there that much less for young people? Um, um, I think it's more about what you want to do. So mm -hmm. actually, my experience within the arts especially is those age limits are not necessarily just blanket age limits for mm -hmm. the sake of it. So sometimes they are because of insurance or legislation. But actually, um, in lots of cases, as you would get when you're applying for a job, the recommendation is to remove age and gender and any personal information. So when you're actually applying, you're, you're a project. Mm -hmm. you're an you know an artist um and so there should be less and less around the age bracket simply because there's an age bracket if that, mm -hmm. if that makes sense i think where that might reflect is do you have the experience and the track record do you have your partnerships in place um, and so that's where you want to put the energy around getting those in place whether you're 18 or under mm -hmm. or over or not um, or 54 so yeah um, because like when I, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to wrap my brains, but I would not know the age of someone applying to mm. most of the funds that I've been part of. Yeah, that information is usually stripped off as yeah. part of how trying to um, create a more equitable and more uh, a, a application processes which aren't so skewed by our own unconscious biases. Um, there are specific funders. So the Prince's Trust is all about- under do you say under 30 so it's under 25 i think it's under 30. under 30 yeah yeah but i think you can apply for funding with them from about ages of 14 or 16. Yeah. it's about yeah. innovation it's about it, it's about you an ent entrepreneurial change making and there's quite a few like that also it's worth talking to if you're in connection with an organization so there are funds which i know of which um we can uh, that, that an organization can apply for to sponsor somebody to allow so I've got a couple that I've got earmarked which if some of the projects we're putting in place here at the mm. Barbican land which they might not but if they do I know where we could support that group of young people creating their own um, uh, own organization and get and be able to get some funding to start them off yeah so i'm earmarking those as kind of like we do, don't have the right to apply for that but if that was what those guys wanted we could be part of that trusted mechanism so sometimes it's worth talking to people you have a relationship and going i really want to learn how to do something or i really want to set up my own um, music production company or i really want to be able to do my own photographic studio and, and usually there's ways of breaking down all the things you might need help with, whether or not that's um, courses you need to do, um, whether or not that can be covered by somebody else's educational yeah. license, whether or not somebody's got two licenses for the software. You know, again, it's that chip, uh, breaking things down into smaller stuff is often a really good way to, because often when we think of something as a whole, it feels really huge. I think that's what stops faster. people like. Yeah. Like moving forward sometimes yeah. they think about the whole project or the whole business and actually there's probably elements of it that yeah. you could do regardless of age or track yeah. record or anything like that that gets you on that on that uh, journey yeah and if i can add maybe it's always checking eligibility because uh, if they have our age restriction it would be very clear yeah. yes yeah can i ask a question yes. And I think it's a question that's maybe more advice on being pointed at the right direction. Um, uh, we made a project, uh, my husband and I, uh, we presented at the Actors Centre in London. Yeah. Uh, we presented our work in progress, but the project of the play, he's a playwright, I'm an actor and I'm a producer because it's the day and age, if you don't produce your own things, you don't do anything, basically. Um, but the project has a community approach to it and we think and we believe that the project would be taken to the communities. Yeah. So, question being, uh, what uh, institution or where, or where can we go or who can we approach to show them the project and tell them like, this is the project, it's a play, but it, like, because it involves the knife culture, it's called the knife in the backpack, and it involves the knife, the knife culture, and that's a huge thing yeah, here huge. In, the, in, in the UK. So we do believe that the project would take some funding or support from
from organizations and from the from the council. Or, I don't know. So maybe you can point me in the right direction to whom can I ask about? Thank you. So we do believe that the project should take some funding or support from organizations and from the from the council. Or, I don't know. So maybe you can point me in the right direction to whom can I ask make it easy for them still so if it's uh is it an intervention project or is it an awareness project awareness. do you, yeah so and is it does it fit do you want to be in the communities which are currently riddled with knife uh, for whom this is a very hidden and definite um problem or is this about stopping it and it exists before that is this something where it's both you want to reach housing estates or you want to get into schools? Is it something where it's living inside a space in an organization or it's a, it goes into the police? Is it, so try what I would do yeah. is break that down because then you can go to somebody and say, I'm gonna riff, this is probably wrong, but uh, we, We've got a project which is about um, trying to stop people getting into knife culture. And uh, uh, we uh, want to be able to run that with families so you're hitting across different age ranges. And so we're designing it to tour into, uh, onto the football pitches at um, uh, high rise estates and into those kind of places. So it's designed so you can get families who can come out for the evening who, from their doorstep. And so you get the younger kids and you get the, maybe the teenagers are on the verge of this. Cool, so I know who it's for, I know it's for families, I know where it lands, I know what places in the city it goes to. And then you can start looking at cities and go, well, this ward has only posh Victorian terraces. This ward has two sets of um, big tower blocks. And that comes back to that initial point about what's the problem you're solving? Like yeah. What, what's the need? Cool. It's different, again, if it's actually about going, actually, this is a problem everyone needs to face. So it needs to be looking here. Do you see the difference of like, this is very precise. This is, no, everyone needs to hear this. So if it's everyone needs to hear this, then that goes to a different place. And maybe that's a conversation to be having with the police, with their youth services, or, you know, somebody else. And they go, oh, cool. So we can do this as a national campaign. Ah, and right. That, just, just on that point is like uh, looking outside of your sector as yeah. well. So I think often what's difficult is if it's um, a theatre um, production or a theatre company, trying to get other theatre companies to oh, kind of take them on or, you know, co-produce whatever with them. And actually it might be the police that is your best partner or it might be a university or mm. um, um, a social housing organisation, for example. Lots of them have corporate social responsibility budgets and agendas and um, or lots of them have um, partnerships within those communities that can help make that happen through resources and space mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and access so and and also what sometimes happens is they exactly as you're saying they will have drawn down funding to address a problem and you're providing the solution so there's there are sometimes just that matches where you don't have to be the one that applies direct to the mm -hmm. funder They've drawn that down. They want to work with, you know, a particular solution to a particular problem that they have in their area, and you're able you're able to feed that in. So it's really valuable to look at things like local authority. Um, 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 what's it called? Plymouth Plan. Plymouth Plan sets out kind of what the city's ambitions are, what the demographics look like, what's happening within the area. You can look at. Um, uh, Oh, public health um, agendas, sports agendas, mm -hmm. those, those kind of things that are really publicly available that are sort of slightly outside of, of art, but definitely there's a, there's a commonality around health and engagement and community yeah. cohesion where actually there are other pockets of funding that people will have accessed or that you might be able to access. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it is being recorded. No, no, no. We are recording it, and we will, um, as long as we haven't messed up on the sound, which we did last week, we'll try and um, post that uh, online for everybody. Yeah, um, and if you have, I'll I'll put some notes against the slides if that's easy, easier. Amazing. So you can. Yeah.
Um, I did have a follow on on that, which was pescally now gone out of my brain, but was really ah. linked. Um, it was really good, was it? Mm, it was definitely, it was definitely it was a clincher. Definitely brilliant. <laughs> it was definitely brilliant. Absolutely, the one thing we needed to add to the mix. <sighs> I was going to add to that, it was, well, your okay. clincher was, is that sometimes the city council and town council have got, spend a lot of money on culture and arts organisations, you just don't really realise. Mm -hmm. Often, they're some of the biggest funders, but you might not think to go to them first, you might go straight to the arts council first, and so, and, and you would then get really great connections into a community, and you'd get really strong networks that could last you a lot longer than potentially just an arts council application would. So yeah, both, I would think I'd say that project sounds like a really good one for the council. Mm -hmm. Thank you so talking. much. Thank I you. would probably say every year from my own areas. 70, 80% of our funding was non-arts council. Yeah. I would say the majority of our funding came through the co-commissioning agreements and working yeah. with councils or with individual businesses or well, and the, and the yeah, argument is that that's only going to get worse. Yeah. In, you know, there's not going to be more funding necessarily into the arts. So it is about what the arts does for those other agendas, you know, where you can place that conversation, which comes back to how do you learn to translate your artistic elements mm -hmm. into those other agendas, those other partners, so that they go, oh, fantastic, that's exactly what we want to achieve as well. And then they come and have, you know, they build a relationship with you there. And it's the that narrative clarity as well, as well. You know, this is still not the clincher. I've no idea what the clincher was. We'll never know what the clincher is. But it's a spin. Um, so that who, what, where, how, why. You know that those are still the things you need to work through on these. Yeah. Is you you know the specificity of who it's for, rather than just the generalised nature of it, and what it will do, and and what it will look and feel like and why anyone would turn up, you know, and how that will feel. You, you're making things easy for people, but you should be doing that anyway for anything you want to interrogate, unless you're turning things through 360 degrees. You are, you're wearing blinkers, you're making yeah. presumptions, you're not really thinking about where and how it lands and why it needs to needs to and land. it's really easy to do I, I'm oh so easy writing some stuff at the moment and you know when someone's like yeah I don't really get that and you you're so adamant you've written yeah. it like that you're so convinced you say like, I must just be having an off day and then you read it back and you're like oh yeah no I didn't actually mention that did I? <laughs> or I haven't <laughs> haven't made that clear have I so there's like especially when you're writing a bid you're so immersed in it yeah. or if you're writing a project or you're a production or anything like that you're so immersed in it that getting someone else to look at it or, or coming back to it with that much more disciplined lens of, okay, have I answered that question? Does it make sense? And I did it today and I was like, oh yeah, no, I didn't actually mention that, did I? And I was convinced I had like a hundred times, I hadn't mentioned it at all. So <laughs> it's really easy to, easy to do and you just have to have that kind of reflective lens that you can put on it and people that will help you with that process mm. as well. And it will make you angry because you'll feel like you've done it. And then somebody will say, but that's not clear. And you'll get slightly I grumpy. I was really feet. angry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Susie. I've got a question about that, about language, which is, yes. there are people out there where writing in English and literacy is not their friends. Mm -hmm. And that's a real barrier for them when it comes to writing applications, which seems to be the way you get your work <laughs> funded. So um, do you have any advice about services or support that people could, could use to help them get some of these applications done? Yeah, the, yeah. the Arts Council has set up an, a set of organisations who are designed to help if people have either accessibility needs or could do with a copywriter or um, need, uh, audio transcriptions of stuff. You should always be able to submit in an alternative format. And if somebody's not letting you, yeah. you should contact them and pretty much demand it you need to still answer their questions you still need to want you the the the, the video has got to make sense or the pictorial walkthrough has got to make sense you still have to do the things but if it needs to be in a different format you do have the right to ask for that but you do need to just make that uh, explain why to them yeah you know 
but like, yeah, I'm seeing lots more. Uh, we're we're <coughs> ourselves included, giving that alternative yeah. format and giving that option because ultimately, as a funder, you want the best projects and yeah. you want the best people. So you don't instantly want to exclude a whole group of people just because they don't. That you know, writing's not their forte. Yeah. So there's there's often more. I think I do come back to that kind of trading and bartering as well. Like who around you could help with that process? and could be you know that that could help you translate into a written if you absolutely yeah. have to do that format and the the there was a there was a we got very far ahead of that and for quite a while it was like yes you can video you can submit in a different way and then we went very conservative again and went very heavily written and only the words will do and we are climbing back out the other yeah. side again which is a relief yeah. but um the that getting past the language barrier, presumptions about uh, coded language. Actually, when you read, a lot of people feel like funding applications are all about fancy words. They're often incredibly small word limits. Mm. And they're actually usually about real plain English and real precise, like, that's why I say use the, like, use the language to the same way you talk to your gran. Like, actually, if you can explain a project, maybe not your gran, um, your great <laughs> uncle, whoever it happens to be, but if you can explain it to somebody who's not a stakeholder in anything yeah. you do and they get it, then that will work on an, on an application as well. And that's not about fancy language. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's quite the opposite. I mean, it's got it. And yeah. also, I think once you've got that template, then there's, and there's maybe time and energy invested yeah. in that. And maybe there is help needed with that, either through friends or support networks yeah. or fund, funded organizations. Then there's a sort of template that you've got. You've got your elevator pitch. You've got your one-liner at the start. The stuff about track record can be re recycled yes. in, in certain ways. So I think there is work at the front, especially if it's not, yeah. you, you know, your comfort space to be writing like that, but it, it can be reused and re reformatted for other stuff as well. You might increasingly notice, I noticed Rising Arts Agency in Bristol have got a call for new artists for their collectives to join them. And they've got a brilliant thing that I'm seeing quite a lot with a lot of the forward organisations, which is um, if you would, if you need help or support with your application, they will do that with you. So that they phrase it, it's much better phrase than that. It's beautifully, eloquently phrased. I've just yep. uh, paraphrased that to death. But what I mean is that you actually, you'll see more and more organizations going because people are wanting to try and remove those barriers over language, over first languages, second languages, over mm. accessibility because of um, access needs. Uh, they are, or because of, um, class or social economic background or because people have been uh, come from a group where they've experienced uh, racism there there is there is a shift and you'll I think you'll start to see more people say and that's they're creating space with their producers and they will help you write that application because it is important those voices are seen and heard and that's also why that phone of the 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 funders yeah I, you know, and go, I have never written an application like this before. English is my second language. Is there somebody on your team or somebody you can suggest or is there a partner organization? Um, because your ideas have equal validity. And as hard, as hard as it is to turn a funder down and rule them out, if you have that conversation, and the answer is no, we don't huh. provide any support and we don't want to speak to you. Yep. Do they really align with your values? Yeah. Like this is this is a two way relationship. And actually, it's as much about you wanting them as an investor in your project so that you can build a relationship so that you can be proud of that partnership and to carry their logo and to carry mm. their brand. Yeah. And I, I would question whether they share your values, if that's yeah. how they're going to approach you. And, and that, actually, ultimately, those funders start to lose out on those amazing projects that, yeah. that go and have conversations with other people who, yeah. are, who are actually passionate about, you know, partnering and doing it properly. Yeah. And there's usually people in cities and in places to help with that. So what are called bridge organisations, Rio, yourself with the yeah. culture, 
um, organizations literature that, works literature but, you works. know they're sort of sec sector support agencies yeah. that that, that off specifically offer support yeah. and advice um, and you'll see people you know advertise about surgeries around surgeries um, uh, webinars like this or workshops yeah. where they're trying to break things and people do it around specific funding pots as well and so if you see a, um, a fund being launched they'll often go we're doing a webinar on this day and these are all these guides as well and so you can usually try and get a bit more info that way um, but I really really agree with what Hannah says there I we've had I've had relationships with funders where the first time we've been funded by them is excellent. The second time we've been looked after by a completely different team. And that has not been a positive yeah. relationship in line with our values. And that absorbs time. And, you know, like we were saying, that absorbs time and energy away from your creative practice, yeah. away from the, the communities or the participants that you really yeah. want to benefit. And so I think, again, it comes back to that don't get sucked into funding for funding's sake. Like yeah. be certain that it's going to take you and your organization with the value set you currently have in the right direction. And you'll know the ones that are right because you've written the application. Don't beat yourself up for the deadlines you miss. Give yourself a pat on the back for the things you submit, yeah. just so you know.